joined here by Richmond Fed President Jeffrey Lacker. First of all, welcome back to Bloomberg. Appreciate you taking time out today. My pleasure, Peter. Got a lot of ground to cover. I want to talk about the economy, regulatory mm -hmm. reform, which I know you delivered a speech on today. Mm -hmm. But if I could, I want to begin with the breaking news from the Federal Reserve. Your colleague, Vice Chairman Donald Cohn, announcing today that he's going to be stepping down in June. Your thoughts on that? Uh, he's going to be greatly missed. He's been a real rock, or just a really solid presence within the Federal Reserve system for the last couple of decades. He's been really important to the institution. Really exemplifies the collegiality, which is really the strength of the system. His ability to listen to different points of view, take them on board, challenge you, um, but come away, um, friends, um, just has really been important to the system, and, and we're really going to miss him. Uh, from your perspective at a, at a regional bank, are you worried at all about the sheer number of vacancies on the Fed board? There are going to be three vacancies now. It is, um, and it's been a strain through this uh, last couple of years to be down two out of seven. Um, it's put a tremendous workload on the governors that remain. Um, I really hope um, that we can organize to get the board of governors fully staffed as soon as possible. All right, let me switch to the economy before we talk about regulatory reform. From your vantage point in Richmond, what do you see happening right now out there in the economy? How worried are you that things are going to get worse before they get better? The economy is shaping up, this recovery is shaping up about as I expected. Uh, an increasing number of American households, and this is true in my district and I think around the country, um, are regaining some confidence in their job prospects, their income prospects, um, and that's leading to a gradual expansion of consumer spending. Businesses um, are gradually increasing their outlays on equipment and software investments, uh, particularly in technology area. I think there's a huge backlog of uh, useful IT projects out there for companies to set their minds to. Um, and uh, export demand has been a, a reasonably strong spot for us lately. Uh, inflation's low, pretty steady, uh, doesn't seem to be unstable right now. So I think we're in a good spot. Having said that, uh, the labor market is just now uh, beginning to bottom out. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a recovery there soon. It typically recovers late in a, in a, in a downturn. Um, and commercial real estate is going to be a drag on growth. Now, it's important about commercial real estate to keep in mind that, you know, compared to housing, it's a small fraction of the economy. So it's not going to be as big a drag as housing. The was. risk of a double dip? I think it's relatively minor right now, and I don't see it having increased at all lately. You, do you see it actually going down? The, the uh, yeah, it has. Um, you know, I think uh, every quarter we get positive growth in final demand. I think the, the risk of a second dip diminishes, and I think it's pretty low right now. What about unemployment right now? We've seen the, the Fed forecast that the, mm -hmm. the chairman presented up on the Hill. <clears throat> What's the risk that we see 10 percent unemployment, mm -hmm. not just still at the end of this year, but even next year? Uh, you know, my baseline forecast would be that the unemployment rate uh, declines only gradually. Now, there's some uncertainty in my mind around that on either side. Um, we could get um, a more rapid snapback in labor market conditions. That's been typical of uh, the period after rec re recessions that are sharper than average. On the other hand, uh, this could be a, a fairly sluggish recovery um, uh, for the labor market just because of the strong gains in productivity growth we've seen. All right, well, let me ask you, against that economic backdrop, you're not a voting member of the FOMC. Of course, right. you're part of those discussions. Uh, what's your sense right now about monetary policy going forward? The most recent statement, uh, uh, conditions are likely to warrant exceptionally low levels of the federal funds rate for an extended period. Again, you're not a voting member, but... Is that language, that statement, something you can live with? Are you okay with that? I think that language is appropriate right now. Uh, we're obviously going to reevaluate it continually as the data flows in and as we get uh, to the next meeting and the next meeting and the next meeting. Um, when we take it out, when we start thinking about um, withdrawing monetary stimulus is obviously going to depend on how the news breaks over the next uh, year or two. What are the factors you're going to be watching most closely? Well, um, I've said uh, publicly that I'm looking for a time when growth is strong enough and well enough uh, sustained and established uh, that, that we know the recovery can continue going forward. And that's a time when the economy is going to need higher real interest rates than we have now. Um, it, I know it's a little bit subjective sounding, um, but uh, I'll know it when I see it, I think. Private sector demand, again, uh, Chairman key, talked about this. Indeed, key. Um, we benefited last quarter from big swing in inventory, uh, in the inventory wind down. Um, and that's not likely to continue, obviously, can't go on forever. Um, but we did see, you know, reasonably, um, you know, positive news out of the consumer sector, the, the sector, the fact that they were able to uh, advance spending in the fourth quarter at the rate they did, although it's tepid by historical standards, was still heartening.
All right, let me ask you about the exit strategy. Are you comfortable with the exit strategy as it's been outlined by the, the Federal Reserve Chairman up on Capitol Hill, all aspects about it? Oh, sure. I mean, he outlined the array of tools we have um, in this recovery. Uh, we have a lot more choices to make uh, because it's not just the interest rate we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about being able to sell assets, uh, raise the interest rate on reserves, um, pull down uh, reserve balances. Uh, so we have a lot more uh, moving parts to the, the puzzle now that we have to think about. And then that raises the question of sequencing. But I think we have all the tools we need. Can you give us a sense, uh, your own sequence, your own timing, how things need to play out? Because there have been questions on the marketplace you know exactly how this is going to work? What goes first? What goes second? It's a good question. Um, we're still researching that. Don't think we need to make a decision in February or March um, about that. Um, to my mind, um, you know, the natural place to start would be asset sales, since those are the things that drove reserves up. Um, there are other tools, however, that we could use to drain reserves, and those are going to be candidates that we're going to look at heavily as well. And then we could lift the interest rate on reserves even before we drain excess reserves back to the level they were before the crisis. So uh, we've got all those tools to play with. We saw from the minutes there's been debate about the question of asset sales, selling mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. You would support that? Um, in the long run, I think the Federal Reserve ought to be out of the mortgage finance business. Uh, I can understand why we got into it last year um, as a matter of uh, trying to stabilize the housing market, but um, I don't think we want to continue to tilt resources towards housing, especially housing finance. I think the broad broad lesson of the crisis ought to be that subsidizing housing finance is dangerous. Um, it encouraged too much leverage on households' parts, and it got us into trouble at the aggregate level as well.